Hello, book two. I have a kind of a Friday reads, recent reads, TBR, am reading mishmash for you, just books. Uh, this is mainly a video about books that I have been, uh, that I've either recently just read or that I'm in the process of reading slowly in increments in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, and they, they're all over the map because they reflect a number of different motivations for reading what I was reading. Most of the time my motivation is fairly predictable. Right? I mean, 95% of the time, my motivation for reading a book is that it's the next book I want to read that's brand new. Something that's either out now or that is immediately coming down the pike uh, that I want to read and then consider whether or not I want to review. Uh, but sometimes, as with all readers, sometimes I get pulled in other directions by other things, including some of you. Uh, so I want to go over those books, some of these books with you and just show them to you. I don't know how many of them. Uh, if any, we've seen on this channel, but uh, I'm going to start off with one that was a little bit disappointing. Uh, I didn't read the advanced copy if I got one, uh, so I, I only read it. I've only read it the one time. I read this this finished copy. Uh, it's a debut, so I expect uh, lots more from this author. It, I'm not saying the book did nothing right, uh, but this is by Sarah Davis Goff, and it's called The Last Ones Left Alive. And it's a novel about post-apocalyptic survivors. Uh, survi not an actual apocalypse, but an apocalypse that sort of drives people crazy, makes the world full of insane, wide-eyed rageaholics, uh, except for a few people who we meet traveling down a road. And if that immediately suggests The Road by Cormac McCarthy to you, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very strong influence on this book. And the stronger an influence of a bad book is on a new book, the worse that new book is going to be. Uh, so I had lots of problems. Uh, with this, mainly uh, the motivations of the characters. It's just a boring old uh, concept is that. The, the, none of the characters seemed, or very few of the characters seemed to make any sense to me. They seem, None of them seemed to really connect. And that is a virus that you can catch directly from the road, where no character motivations even exist, and where nobody behaves like anyone would even in a traumatic post-apocalyptic scenario. I wanted to like this. I know that's a cliche, but I did. I wanted to like this book. I don't think I will reread it until maybe it, if it gets a paperback, I will reread it then. Uh, but uh, there were enough things right in it, enough, especially in terms of dramatic pacing. There were enough things right in it to make me think that this is just a debut novel, and debut novels are often severely flawed, and that if this author keeps... The author is an Irish journalist, and then she keeps writing novels, uh, my hope is that they will just get steadily better. Uh, then the next one, I also liked. <laughs> uh, I didn't love it. It's not a rave. Uh, but I did like it. I, it's just, uh, it's it's by J.A. Dauber, uh, and it's called Mayhem and Madness, The Chronicles of a Teenage Supervillain. And I admit, I was largely drawn to it by the cover. <laughs> that is a fantastic cover. The artistic decision to blur everything but the two of them is just genius. Uh, and this is about uh, a young boy who discovers, uh, you know, 20 feet under his family's home, a um, giant mechanical suit of armor <laughs> uh, of unknown purpose or provenance, except that he, the boy is pretty sure that it's connected with his missing father. Uh, and what he wants to understand his father better, and that aspect of the book, you know, an insecure boy, the, the lapsed bond between a boy and the father, that aspect of the book I, I liked quite a bit. Uh, Finding a mysterious piece of technology that can or cannot determine the, the shape of your destiny. Uh, that idea and the way it's pursued in this book was the, the main weakness, was the reason why I only liked it and didn't love it. And that is that that is predictable. And in a subgenre like YA fiction, which is already intensely predictable, you want to mix it up a little if you can't bring, if you're not going to bring really good prose to the table. And this author does not bring really good prose. That doesn't wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with the prose. But it doesn't it doesn't ever just set you back and make you think, wow, that was well put. That never happens. Instead this is plot driven. It's what happened next. It's even a bit of romance thrown in there, a bit of high school romance. And it will keep you reading. I I, I enjoyed it. It's just uh, the whole time that I was reading it, I was thinking, you know, this motif boy and suit of armor has been done much better than this. Probably uh, <laughs> probably the best example that I or anyone else will ever encounter is the Iron Giant. But even so, even, even apart from that, 
this is this book traffics in very familiar YA territory, and I, I kept wanting it to surprise me a bit, and it doesn't. It doesn't ever do that. It pleased me, but it never surprised me. I don't put much uh, premium on being surprised, so I, I'm not holding it much against the book. Uh, but uh, it didn't. It didn't knock my socks off. Well, however, I did read YA. <laughs> I did read YA for this video, that did knock my socks off, and I don't know. Is this is a debut? I should check and see. This is, in fact, a debut. Good Lord. Okay. Uh, this is by uh, Shanna Youngdow, and it's called As Many Nows As I Can Get. Uh, that's the cover. Uh, it's about two late teens. We go, in, we go into the first year of college, uh, and it's, it's Scarlett and David, and they're the two main characters, and they have been part of each other's lives forever, as, as, uh, as Scarlett puts it at one point. It's the Scarlet and David landscape. It's just that unremarkable. They've been part of each other's lives forever. And suddenly, something happens that triggers an extra chemistry, that, that shifts their, their relationship for one drunken night into something more, or something different than that lifelong, you know, sort of accepted like the landscape friendship. And neither one of them knows quite how to deal with it. And it it lapses back, and they both wonder: Is it going to is it going to happen again? And should it happen? And uh, the title is a, 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 a book two. Eyes on the prize. Okay, I'm the pretty one. <laughs> uh, the The title is a play on uh, chronological structure. As many nows as I can get is is a, there's a there's a great moment a great scene that's connected with the title but also uh, the book is is told a chronologically so you, the narrative jumps all around in time uh, with long passages shorter passages very impressionistic passages very passionate and it's all done wonderfully totally reassured totally confident uh, the the author is just totally confident of what she's doing and how she's pulling it off. Now, either that is the product of the kind of editing that I always carp doesn't happen with American books anymore, or this is a stupendously talented author who's going to write a shelf of great YA books. I'm okay with either one, but boy, oh boy. And no, again, no offense meant to, to Mayhem and Madness. Mayhem is the name of the suit, uh, the, the, me the mechanical suit. No offense meant to this book at all, but this is normal YA. Normal, very good YA. This is, you, you wouldn't be embarrassed to read it. You wouldn't be, in, uh, a YA uh, reader wouldn't be, Embarrassed wouldn't consider their time wasted to read it. But this is more than that. This is the kind of YA that I especially like because an adult can read it and, and not even think about the categorization. I strongly, strongly recommend it. It is young love. It is friends becoming lovers. It is, it again, again, like Mayhem and Madness, it is many, many YA cliches, many much well-trodden ground in YA genre. But, <laughs> again, it's all about the execution, and this is just... I did not realize when I was reading this that it was... I took the dust jacket off, so I didn't realize that it was a debut novel. So kudos to uh, Shanna Youngdahl. Kudos to her if this is her first time at bat. Uh, but it wasn't all YA. <laughs> the, the next book I want to show is a whopper. It's a chunker. It's a doorstop. And I got it to it through two other doorstops. I was dipping in and out just uh, casually of Anthony Burgess's collected uh, book reviews, but do uh, blondes prefer, excuse me, but do blondes prefer gentlemen? I was dipping in and out of that sort of diffidently now and again. I have two bookcases of collected book reviews, my own, my own chosen kind of writing and a thing that I love to read. Uh, I, I had that book on the shelf and I, every time I would, when I would get up and I would prowl the little book room, I would stop and read a little of that. And that's the closest that my connection to that book was coming, until Mark at Richardson Reads found a gigantic volume of the collected reviews and essays of Evelyn Waugh and sent it to me. And this great big thing that, that is, was just, I lost myself in it. Just lost myself in it. Got behind in writing because I, I was reading from that book so consistently. Uh, all of, of Waugh's great deadline prose, not all of it, but a, a huge chunk of it, a thousand pages of his deadline prose, with uh, much of it dealing with books that are no longer around. Uh, like I've mentioned on this channel before, if you're a professional book reviewer, if that's what you do, 
and even if you're an occasional book reviewer, you're always going to have work in hand. The idea if you're a working book critic is that you always have some work in hand. You have some editor out there somewhere waiting for you to file so that he can, two years later, pay you. <laughs> and and uh, you're willing, most, most working book critics are willing to take just about anything as long as it pays. They're willing to take just about anything. I, find, I myself found myself reviewing every kind of book in the world. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of a, kind of a roller coaster ride. Uh, but you always, the key is to always have something. And it, the, it, it's a better feeling, a little more nerve-wracking, but a better feeling the more some things you have waiting, like airplanes stacked for takeoff. Uh, I, I right now have uh, five pending deadlines that I am working on in one way or another. I could theoretically, I'm the fastest book reviewer that I know of. I could theoretically do them all today and just have them done, but I like the feeling of letting some of them percolate, especially since some of the books are more complex than others. So you want to percolate a little, walk around, think about your verdict because it's going to stand for a long time on an important book. So uh, I was reading that WA volume and I was just plowing through it and loving it. And then when I was starting to reread essays in it, reviews in it for like the, the second or third time, then I realized it was probably time to put it down. And when I put it down, I thought, okay, well, let me go back to that Burgess volume, But Du Blanc's Prefer Gentleman, and just spend as much time in that as I did with Waugh. I think Burgess is as talented an English novelist as Waugh, so, and as great a reviewer, at least, if not more so. So I, I spent a huge amount of time in that book uh, that I really couldn't afford and that I should have been spending on newer books, and I blame Mark Richardson. <laughs> and, then, and then when I was done with that, when I was reading But Du Blanc's for a Gentleman, and I was realizing, okay, you're now reading this review for the third time, I, I put it away and I realized, when I was at that bookshelf, I realized, oh, I don't want to stop. <laughs> I want to keep going. I want to keep reading reviews in addition to everything else I do. So I pulled down another chunker, another huge book. This is the complete collected essays of V.S. Pritchett. Oh my god! <laughs> This was done by Random House in a big, gigantic, 1,200-page hardcover, uh, right alongside a companion volume that looks exactly the same of his complete collected short stories. Now, I have never been able to like V.S. Pritchett as a writer of fiction. I've had people swear to me over the years that, by his short stories, saying that volume of short stories is a life-changing masterpiece. You really should settle down and spend the time with it. And maybe I will. Maybe I will do that. Uh, I wish that I had uh, a normal dust jacket and hardcover of this volume of the collected essays, uh, but I've never really liked the guy's fi uh, fiction, but I have always liked his nonfiction, and so I went back to this book. <laughs> I took it down off the shelf, and I have been living in this book. This is one of the things for this Friday Reads that is not by any means complete. I am still living in this book. <laughs> uh, this huge book where I get to be in Pritchett's company while he writes about, again, anything under the sun. He, he was a, you know, a working writer, had all sorts of other jobs, but he was also a very much a working book critic, which meant that if, a, if an editor wrote to him in, in Burgess's book, he, he, he uh, captures the, the world of it quite well, where he would get, he'd be in the middle of a biography of, you know, I don't even know, uh, Ryder Haggard, and get a cable from a publisher saying, can you review such and such at 1,500 words, reply soonest. <laughs> he would have to go to the post office and send a telegram saying, yes, of course, my answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and this is the same thing. Here you have Pritchett writing on everything, on absolutely everything. If a publisher came to him and said, uh, we're coming out with a new edition of Dracula, would you write a preface? He would. He would say yes. <laughs> if, uh, if a publisher came to him and said, you know, we're coming out with a huge collection of some little-known letters by Dostoevsky. Would you be willing to write a preface? He would say yes. <laughs> Absolutely, he would say yes. And as a result, this thing is just a, a tour to horizon of, of, the, of the literary world, and endlessly fascinating, just endlessly so. So I have been spending a lot of time with this book. I have been going through uh, essay after essay. Sometimes you start off by picking the authors you really like, and you go to them first. Then sometimes I pick authors that I, uh, I intentionally pick authors that I very much don't like, to see what Pritchett has to say about them, see whether or not he can change my mind. I've had that happen. Uh, and then I go to just just pieces in general, just read them and see what he has to say about such and such. Even if I'm bored with the subject, even if I think I know the subject, just read it through and see. See what he has to say. See if he sparks a thought. I love it. I also love, I must admit, uh, from the from 
you know, backstage. I love watching how he does it. Same thing with Waugh, same thing with, with Burgess, same thing with I'm sure this pattern has not ended. I'm sure I will be going from this to another big collection of reviews. I like watching how they do it. I know I know the the scaffolding of the process very well. No one has ever come to me and asked me to write a preface, but editors come to me all the time and ask me if I can write a review of such and such a book because for their own reasons, they want it reviewed and they need it reviewed quickly and they're willing to pay a pittance, of course, and they go to the people on their writing list that they know will do the work as opposed to, for instance, a Virginia Woolf who will say, yes, I will review the new book about Dr. Johnson and not be done in two years. <laughs> you want it done right away. So uh, I know the scaffolding behind a lot of these pieces and that makes them all the more interesting to read because I get to see how he does it you know how are you going to do it if you get am I going to be able to tell from a review in this book that you knew nothing about the subject before you got the book and that you're using everything in the book to make your review sound like you've been reading this author forever <laughs> will I be able to tell that will I see indications and if the, and what about the other side? If it's an author you know really well, love, have poured over, will I be able to tell that in your writing about that author? It's just, sorry. Sorry to go on at such length, but I have been having so much fun rereading my own compatriots. I mean, it, it, I, don't, I don't for a minute put myself on the same level as a Waugh or a Burgess or a Pritchett, but nevertheless, it is my profession. It is the thing I do and have been doing for a very long time. And occasionally... I've liked the results of what I do. Occasionally, I, w there have been books where I thought, okay, I wrote this up at 800 words, and all the big guns did. All, not only all the great book critics, but lots of authors. You know, not, lots of novelists or historians wrote this up as well. And I think mine stands up to all the rest of them. I have had that happen a few times. It's one of the only kinds of writing I would ever claim that about. Uh, I, I chalk it up mainly to an absolutely ungodly amount of experience. <laughs> but, but one way or another, it makes me feel more involved. Of course, it makes me feel more involved with books like this. So that is a very much a part of my Friday Reads. It will probably be a part of next Friday Reads if I do this kind of wool gathering again. Uh, and then the, the next book was sparked by Comic Book Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday was nearly 100 degrees Fahrenheit here in Boston. It was soapingly humid. And there were violent thunderstorms roaming around the neighborhood, knocking on the door and showing up at random. And so Wednesday just didn't feel like a day for making videos. And I had a whole, as usual, as usual, I, have a, I had a whole mental slot of, you know, of videos that I wanted to make. I do that every day. I don't know how you people don't. I honestly don't. I don't know how you get up in the morning and think, well, I, I'll be making a video on Friday and, and just leave it at that. I don't know how you do it. I get up in the morning and I immediately start thinking, when we're on our first uh, morning dog walk with the bean, I immediately start thinking, okay, what do I want to talk to you about today? And ideas come flooding to mind. I swear I could make 10 videos a day. I easily could. I don't know how you pare down. I really don't. Not only do some of you pare down to once a week or, or less than that, but even when you do make that video, it's only 10 minutes long. <laughs> anyway, one of the videos I was going to make on Wednesday was comic books. I didn't make a comic book video this weekend, or this week, because it was, it was boiling hot and threatening thunderstorms and dark as twilight here in the place. So... But one of the things I was going to talk about, I look at comic books, what's coming out on Wednesdays. I look ahead of time to sort of prepare myself, see if maybe there's something coming out that's worth the, the, the detour to the comic shop. And on Wednesday, there was really nothing. There was one thing that was of interest, but I wasn't going to buy it because I already have it. I have enough of it. I have a version of it. Uh, the comic book reprint culture is very uh, robust comic book companies, since they're no longer the two major uh, superhero comic book companies, Marvel and DC, are pretty much consciously no longer in the business of putting out individual weekly comics that their fans will like. In fact, Marvel seems to have adopted the business plan of putting out weekly comics that they know their fans don't like. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what they're expecting is going to happen to their profit margin if they do that, but nevertheless, only one thing is, uh, you don't browbeat, you don't, you don't purity test your readers into liking something that they don't like. Your job is to provide them with what they do like. Uh, but since the companies are very actively not doing that anymore, they they know that a lot of money is surefire locked into their reprint culture. So there are reprints all the time, and, and often they will reprint the same thing over and over again, uh, with tiny variations or sometimes no variations at all. And one of the things, the, one of the only thing that was of interest to me last Wednesday for comics was one of those things. It was a it was a collected 
hardcover, I think, slipcase maybe, volume of The Authority, uh, a non-Marvel and non-DC team book uh, written by Warren Ellis and drawn by Brian Hitch. Uh, this is The Authority. Uh, and I was going to look at it. If I'd gone to the comic shop, I was going to look at it and see you know, what it has and what it doesn't have. I've had a number of different Authority omnibuses. This is the entire run of Ellis and Hitch before the artist, Brian Hitch, left. And it took an absolute act of God to get him to stay as long as he did. This is back when Warren Ellis was, could be edited. This is back, back when Brian Hitch did finished work and didn't rely on his inkers to just make him look good. And when both of them could be relied upon to finish projects that they had started. They absolutely cannot be relied upon to do that anymore. It doesn't matter if DC Comics hauls them in with a phalanx of lawyers. They're still going to back out, and they'll just pay. Warren Ellis will just pay a flat fee of a million dollars to cancel a project, because he and Brian Hitch simply cannot finish what they start anymore at all. It always makes me laugh when Brian Hitch starts some project and goes to some, the, you know, the nearest comic book convention and says, I've always wanted to do this, I'm on for the long haul, mate, it's going to be 20 issues, when everybody in the audience has to know that's not true. He still says it. He's been doing this for 20 years. And he still says it. Uh, but this is, was in their heyday, and the, there's a blurb on the front of this uh, from Comic Book Resources that says, The authority is the DNA of 90% of the superhero comics published today. And, uh, you know, back then, back, this was in the, the uh, this was, uh, what are the dates on the authority? I don't know that. Uh, yeah, the 1990s. This was the 1990s. Uh, and boy, oh boy, is that true. You really cannot overstate the impact that the that this, specifically the first 12 issues of this series, had on superhero comics and especially team comics. This is a story of a loose-knit team of, of super-powered beings. There's this woman here, Jenny Sparks, who is the spirit of the, 21st, of the 20th century. She is the embodiment of electricity. There's uh, a woman called the Engineer, who has pints of nanotech blood instead of human blood and is therefore capable of all sorts of magical technology. There's a character named Jack Hawksmore who is psychically bonded to, to cities. He's the god of cities. There's a solar-powered Superman knockoff called Apollo, who is super strong and, and super fast and has the power to fly and whatnot. And he is best friends and also lovers with a gritty, dark, cowled uh, street crime fighter called the Midnighter. In other words, Apollo and the Midnight are, are best friends and lovers, and they are explicit knockoffs of Superman and Batman, which it, recently DC Comics has folded the Authority universe and its characters into its normal continuity. Absolutely insane. Just as insane as them doing that with, uh, with uh, the Watchmen, with, with Alan Moore's Watchmen universe. But, but even more so, because now in, in, in actual DC continuity, you have Superman and Apollo. We have Batman and Midnighter. Utterly ridiculous. But that hadn't happened yet when these came out. Uh, there, were, there were a bunch of other characters. There's, of course, a, a female character whose only superpower is to grow claws and start to grow feral when she fights. <sighs> she has wings, but that, that's a small difference. You all know I can't stand that gimmick when it comes to superheroes. But, but, uh, but uh, these issues, uh, the team faces steadily increasing threats the first one is a supervillain who is uh, demolishing cities on Earth in a pattern that will mimic a, a tattoo design that he made, I guess. I guess that Earth is his Etsy store. And then the second uh, plotline involves the, the invasion of Earth by an alternate reality in which the blue-skinned aliens want to turn whole continents into rape camps. And then the third uh, menace that the, our heroes face is when the original owners of Earth return. That the, the original beings that evolved on Earth liked it as a noxious, you know, sort of Venus knockoff of carbon dioxide and gunk and whatnot. And those original owners left on a tour of the universe, and when they come back, they want to re-terraform Earth and kill all the humans involved, which they see as a kind of infestation. In other words... Uh, it's, it's classic Warren Ellis, who is always bored and always upping the ante on his story. So you will have a character who is slowly walking through the entire multiverse, all existing universes, and destroying the whole universe at a time. 
and another whole universe at a time, and another whole universe at a time, and he's headed to this universe. And, you know, because I, 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 when I'm high on cocaine, I really can't think of a menace bigger than that. It's got to be bigger. Everything's got to be bigger every time. We should also notice something else about those three storylines. Uh, even if you haven't read the issues, you'll notice that in order for, for Warren Ellis to make those three storylines work, massive numbers of innocent people have to die. They're very brutal stories, in other words. And the team is a team to match those menaces. They routinely kill uh, civilians. They routinely advocate the killing of huge numbers of civilians. I lost track of how many times rereading this volume that uh, uh, some character says, sterilize, and then you fill in the blank. Now, one of those times, it's the moon. But another time, it's Tokyo. <laughs> or Japan. The whole archipelago of Japan is just sterilizing. The, the alien menace here that is killing these people on the street is so bad that what you need to do is kill every living thing here, including all of the civilians, all of the innocents that you're, that you're here to protect. That, that kind of thing goes on and on when, when Jenny Sparks uh, decides to attack the number 10 Downing Street, the Buckingham Palace of the, this alternate Earth. She destroys it with a massive lightning bolt. And uh, when thanks to Brian Hitch drawing it, it's a very impressive visual. The building is full of hundreds of innocent people, and it, they're all incinerated. And the bad guy's not. He survives it. <laughs> and there's all sorts of raunchy sexual talk. The characters are sexually obsessed with each other and with the villains. The villains are all sexually obsessed. The first one tortures women who are just these mindless drones that he can, that he can brutalize at will. The second one, of course, never stops talking about rape camps, and in the final fight that he has with two of our heroes, is constantly threatening to rape them, too. Uh, and, and then the, the third one is, you know, everybody's going to die, so this is a perfect time for making sex jokes. <laughs> uh, and also, it should be pointed out, I should, since I'm on a rant here about the authority, I should point out that the characters also don't like each other gone completely from the authority is any idea that the teammates are friends. Even the Apollo and Midnight are lovers, but they don't seem to like each other. And none of the other characters do. They're constantly insulting each other, backbiting each other, undercutting each other, swearing at each other, threatening to kill each other. And boy, oh boy, did that sentiment seep out into the rest of the comic book world. Boy, oh boy, did it ever. Oh, man. I don't think it's still out of the bloodstream of, of the comic book world. But I believe that this, that the authority especially this first run, it blew everybody away, including me. The visuals are incredible. Uh, when, when Warren Ellis gets going, his imagination is very appealingly uh, surprising. And there are some wonderful moments in here. There are wonderful, funny moments. The, there's a doctor on the team, for instance, this guy, uh, who is the shaman of Earth. He is psych psychically connected to Earth. And we're, he has visions of all the other shamans who have gone before him. And they're all... Earth always needs a doctor, one of his predecessors tells him. And we see crowds of those predecessors. I'll never be able to go straight to a page. Uh, but we see crowds of his predecessors, and uh, in some of, those, some of those crowds are very good visual impressions, where we see that one of those doctors is the doctor, the fourth doctor, the only real doctor. Uh, another one is, is Bones McCoy. It's, it's neat to see that. That is a neat visual trick. Some of the, the dramatic beats in here are really good, especially at the end, since Jenny Sparks is the spirit of the 20th century. We gradually start to realize that as the 20th century comes to an end, she has to die. And the, the, that is orchestrated really well in the final pages of the final story in this collection. But the comic book industry paid a huge price for being so impressed by this stuff because it immediately started to try and imitate it. I believe that the entirety of the New 52 relaunch of all of DC's continuity sprang ultimately from the authority. There's no difference. Uh, in the New 52, when the Justice League was relaunched, there's no difference between the Justice League and the authority except costumes. Other than that, all the sense of camaraderie, all the sense of friendship and, and fellowship, all the sense of altruism and doing good for good's sake, all of that is gone. All of that is gone in the Jim Lee Justice League. And it takes, it took years to get it back. I'm not sure it's completely back. And, and so on and so forth, right down the line. This kind, of, this kind of maximalist, brutalist nonsense took over the superhero world. And I think that was largely to the superhero world's detriment. Uh, so I was rereading this because I didn't get that, that 
new collection of the authority. It would have been this plus a little more, but this is the part of the authority that I remember vividly. This is the part that I really like. After this, once Frank quietly took over as artist, the, the brutality, the perversion, just goes through the roof. It just multiplies by 50,000. It becomes its own, you know, tail-eating snake after that and becomes absurd. So I just, I just, <laughs> I read some of it, but it had very little interest to me whatsoever. And again, right away, when Frank, the artist Frank Quitely takes over for Brian Hitch, and right away, in the new storyline, there's a new storyline that starts up right at the end of this one, the, the rape threats start immediately. It's just... Just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. There's, it's, it's, uh, it was the start of a horrible phase for superhero comic books that I would like it to come out of, but I don't see that happening anytime, anytime soon. Uh, and then uh, this next one is just an ordinary book. <laughs> it wasn't a chain of events from one book to another. It wasn't a, a, a remorse read because I missed Comic Book Wednesday. It was just a new book. <laughs> uh, I think it comes out this month. I think we might have seen it. It's by Ian Urbina. It's called The Outlaw Ocean. Uh, and it's it's uh, the author journeying on what he rightly calls the last frontier anywhere in the world, which is the open ocean, the high seas. In other words, not shipping lanes and not coastal, but but the the wide open oceans that I it's unless you've been on them, it's difficult to explain what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about a Norwegian cruise. I am not talking about uh, you know sailing. 20 miles offshore in order to fish. I'm talking about the open ocean, the, the water world parts of this planet, where you are a long, long, long way from any kind of land. And where there are, there is no law. There's, there's of course, no law <laughs> in such places. Uh, and there are people, lots and lots of people, who are who have predicated their whole existence, and especially their whole business model, on the fact that there is no law. And I've been over vast, vast tracts of that world. And uh, Urbina captures it really well. It's a lawless place. It's a dark and dangerous place. It's also unbelievably beautiful. And I was expecting that in a, in a fairly hefty book about human trafficking and slavery and piracy on the open ocean and all sorts of uh, international stuff, the, the nations also do all sorts of crimes because they just go to the open ocean to do it. Uh, so they know they're not accountable to any law, even fledgling international law. I was surprised that in the midst of all that, the beauty of the open ocean also comes through in this book. I, I, I uh, was tremendously impressed with the whole thing. Uh, and then the last one, so this is going on forever, the last book that I want to show you I was also very impressed with. This is by Glynis Fox, and this is Charlotte Bronte before Jane Eyre. The title is a bit of a misnomer because this is the whole Bronte story. This is all the Brontes, the sisters, the brother, the parents. Uh, and it's a graphic novel. And it's drawn in a style that I didn't think I would really like. This sort of cartoony, childish style. I didn't think that I would really like that. Uh, but I ended up really liking it. I, I think it, I also think, I ended up thinking that it, it really goes well with the story. Uh, because we forget how young the Brontes were. And this, this book doesn't let you forget that. I thought it was beautiful. Really, really good. I am going to put it, when, I, when I'm, I'm going to reread it. I'm going to give it a little time and reread it. But when I'm completely done with it, uh, I'm going to put it on the shelf with my Bronte books. There's no way that that I'm letting this out of my collection. I thought it was that good. Uh, and I worry, well, I guess that's why I'm making this video. If you were to see this in your bookstore, you might think it was a kid's book. You might think it was for kids. And it's not. I mean, it's it's done with such discretion and intelligence that I believe a kid could read it. Uh, but it's for adults. An, an adult, this is an adult story and a brutal story. And I can't recommend it high enough. Uh, the, it, it captures uh, the magic of the Brontes. It captures the magic of their world. It captures the fact that in their world they had access to an imaginative plane that most of the people around them did not. And it made them the closest that we come to supernatural. I just I just loved it. I just loved it. So I don't know. This, this has been... Uh, last year there were a few adult graphic novels like this that really blew me away. I think this is the first one to really do it this year. I don't know that I would count a cartoon introduction to the calculus. Uh, it was also really, really good, but I don't know that I would count it. It doesn't mean to tell a story, I don't think, in the way that this does. Uh, this reminded me of, uh, for instance, uh, The Reluctant Spy by Dietrich Bonhoeffer from last year, or The Diary of Anne Frank, a graphic novel adaptation. It reminded me of those things. So 
Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, and that's it. That that was my uh, my Friday reads, am reading, TBR, currently reading, whatnot. <laughs> this is a sort of mishmash of current books. I guess am reading counts as all of that. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. This has gone on hideously long, but I will be back. Thank you, book two.